Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, if you like this, you'll definitely like these or that. That is, find a piece that you like and let's discover how to find other pieces that you may like or that are worth comparing to it. And in these groups, as I have mentioned, and just, just to run through the exercise very quickly, there are four works. Two of them are roughly contemporaneous. Two of them come either earlier or later, but have something in common with the two previous ones. So the initial group are A and B. The later or earlier ones are one and two. And by comparing A to one and B to two or A to two or B to two or A to B and one to two, well, you know what I mean. You can compare them all and you can learn something and hear something, more importantly, and enjoy something, most importantly of all. So in this particular group, A and B, our first two works, are Beethoven's Fifth and Seventh Symphonies. I mean, iconic works, everybody loves them. Well, I hope everybody loves them, but very, very different. They're very different in their balance, in the weight that Beethoven gives them. And in this particular group, what I, I would like you to focus on is just that, where is the, the, the major statement happening in the symphony? Now, you might think that in Beethoven's fifth, it's right in the first movement, you know, da-da-da-da, right? It's not. <laughs> the first movement is like one of the shortest movements in the symphony, actually. It's very compact. It's very turbulent. But because most people don't listen to the whole symphony, they don't know what happens later. The big movement in Beethoven's Fifth is the finale, the huge, victorious, gigantic finale, where the struggle with fate, supposedly embodied in the first movement, is resolved in a huge victory parade that goes on and on and on. The seventh, on the other hand, is quite different. The obvious weight is in the first movement and everything that comes after is a little bit lighter and more jolly and less, less intricately worked out. There's a big, slow introduction to the whole symphony. First of all, the first movement, big, long introduction. It could be a whole separate movement. It's attached via a link of of repeated E's, do, 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 like that, to the first movement proper, um, which is also a very, very ample movement, then follows the delicious allegretto, not really a slow movement, but beautiful, gorgeous, oh my God, it was so popular, even in Beethoven's day. Then a bouncy scherzo with lots of repeats. It goes round and round and round. You never know when it's going to stop. And then a volcano of a finale, but it's short and it's really compact. It's almost like a happy version of the first movement of the Fifth Symphony. But the weight of that work is in the first movement and it engages in a consistently differently patterned range of emotions designed to to proceed to a to end with an ultimate you know triumph but it relaxes as it goes that's the bottom line it really does so linked to beethoven's fifth and seventh are two other iconic works that came later the brahms first which is like the beethoven fifth in c minor um, and is a finale symphony, but not in quite the same way that the Beethoven is. And listen carefully to see how Brahms does it. It begins in a dark minor key, but it has a big long introduction at the beginning. Uh, but it's still a fairly dark minor key. It's full of struggle and stress, but it ends with a glorious victorious finale with a famous marvelous tune that everybody knows and loves. But that finale also has a big, long, brooding introduction. It seems that Brahms stuck the introduction onto the first movement later, which is actually true. He did do it later and then realized, well, OK, <laughs> I mean, the finale still has this. It reminds us of what has come before, before it proceeds to clear the air and allow triumph to emerge. So while the finale is victorious and the heaviest and weightiest movement in the symphony, it operates on a somewhat different plan than Beethoven's fifth does. And I want you to pay attention to those two big introductions to the first movement, the finale, and see how they they affect the weight of the movements. The, 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 the weight meaning, you know, how how impressive they are, how powerful they are, how expressive they become, and how the contrast, you know, sort of, sort of contrast 
works in terms of what the symphony is trying to express. But you'll hear it. it describing it is impossible. It's like, ah. So you can compare Beethoven's fifth to Brahms' first. But because of the big, long introduction to Brahms' first, you can also compare it to the big introduction in the first movement of Beethoven's seventh. And then we also have as our number two later work, Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony. Now Tchaikovsky's fourth does in a sense what Beethoven's fifth does. In other words, it begins very tragically. It's very dark and very tragic. And there is a fate motto, that brass fanfare at the beginning that, that, that comes back over and over again, crushing hope and whatnot in the first movement. And it also comes back in the finale. But the finale is, like Beethoven's seventh, a a relaxed and happy and joyous and jubilant finale that's quite a bit shorter. The first movement in Tchaikovsky's fourth is almost as long as like the next three combined. It's a big, long movement. And that finale is quite peppy and, and, and simple in its expression. But, of course, but, so the structure of Tchaikovsky's fourth is closer to that of Beethoven's seventh. But the emotional expression, the tragedy to triumph, is much closer to Beethoven's fifth and Brahms' first. So there are all kinds of interesting comparisons that you can make between these works. And if you get a feel for what the, the sequence of emotion is in each symphony, you'll probably have uh, a lot of discoveries when you listen to the later ones and follow their individual sequences of emotion and expression and see how composers arrive at similar ideas through similar means and similar ideas through dissimilar means. That's the point here, and I hope you have a great time doing it. So keep on listening, friends. Take care.